Hello everyone and welcome to this third lesson on the tenets of quantum mechanics. Today we are going to talk about towards the Schrodinger equation. So last time we already saw the first two lessons. In the first lessons we discussed a little bit about the main tenets of classical mechanics that we can use uh, to understand or to better understand quantum mechanics. And in the second lesson we have seen the necessity or the reasons why we should, we should need a quantum theory. So in this lesson essentially we are going to introduce the main equations of quantum mechanics, which is the, the, the Schrodinger equation. And we are going to see more or less how these equations are used in quantum mechanics to make predictions. So in last time uh, lesson, in lesson number two, we have discussed a little bit about the black body radiation and the photoelectric effect. And one of the main conclusions that appear from these, um, from these two uh, phenomena is that if we want to describe them mathematically, we are forced to introduce the concept of quanta of energy. So there is a, par a shift paradigm here that is happening. While in, um, in the classical mechanics, the energy is essentially a continuous variable, in the quantum mechanics now we are dealing with the concept of quanta of energy which means that energy now can be absorbed or emitted in chunks essentially and this is something that we do not observe in classical mechanics so it's a new fact that we have to take into account when we build a quantum theory in the same way, we also discuss a little bit about the double slit experiment, which essentially showed the wave particle duality of, um, of, uh, of uh, elementary particles such as electrons. And one of the very, very puzzling um, conclusion that uh, appears or that emerge in the double slit experiment is that essentially because of the wave particle duality that we can observe experimentally, we have to give up with the idea of classical trajectories. So we might be still uh, able to talk about trajectories in quantum mechanics, but this is going to be a very, very different concept if compared to the concept of, of classical mechanics. In particular, in classical mechanics, we know that a trajectory can always be depicted if we have the position and the momentum or velocity of the particle. Well, in quantum mechanics, now we have to give up with this idea. Uh, we are in front of the wave particle duality, so trajectories now are very, very different, and we are going to understand this the more we go ahead with this lesson and we start to deal with the equations. So in particular, one very puzzling principle that appeared at the very beginning of quantum mechanics was the uncertainty principle. Where in the uncertainty principle, essentially we now are in a, in a regime or we are in a situation that is drastically different from what we have observed in classical physics. In particular, this principle tells us that one cannot know uh, um, velocity and position of a particle at the same time. Either we can have a very high precision in knowing the position of the particle or we can have a very high precision in knowing the momentum of the particle but we cannot know both of them uh, at the same time. This was a very very puzzling fact at the beginning of, of uh, or let's say uh, at the beginning of the emergence of quantum mechanics and this is a principle that was discovered by Heisenberg in 1927. So this principle is called the uncertainty principle. It is also called the Heisenberg principle. So of course, rejecting the ordinary ideas of classical mechanics, in particular, the concept of um, a trajectory does not bring us to any positive principle that we can use to build a quantum theory. But this is now, this is a principle that we, we know, uh, that we observed experimentally. So it has to be embedded somehow in the theory as soon as we have equations that uh, can make predictions. 
functions uh, in, the, in the regime of, of, of quantum objects. Um, so this is a fact that we have to take into account while we go ahead with the depiction of, 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 of quantum mechanics. Um, so now that we are in a very different situation and we have now in the we, we have now the wave particle duality to take care of uh, we have to um, start to depict a different mathematical framework to make predictions for quantum systems so in order to obtain what we call a quantum mechanics essentially and as we have seen in the previous slide we cannot really use use uh, the concept of classical trajectories anymore. We have to come up with a different mathematical formalism. And this m different mathematical formalism is practically mm, represented by what we nowadays call the wave function. This is a psi function that you see here that is a function of coordinates and which is essentially a complex function, not necessarily um, a real function. And this complex function must have, must have certain properties in order to have a physical meaning. The very first property is that um, we take for granted now that the state of a system is going to be described by this function. So its square, um, or let's say the square of its modulus, um, must determine the probability of the distribution uh, of the values of the coordinates. So what do we mean here? If we have, let's say, one particle that is represented by its position Q, then the system is going to be represented um, and described in terms of a wave function psi of q. And if we take psi square and we multiply this by dq, so by essentially an element of volume, uh, this is this is going to become the probability that a measurement performed on the system provide exactly, um, let's say, the, the values for the coordinate that we can find in the element dq of the configuration space. So in a way, this is not very different from, let's say, classical statistics where we talk in terms of probabilities, just that now probabilities are represented by the square of of, uh, of the modulus of the wave function, where the wave function is not a real function, but it's a complex function. So one might say that now in quantum mechanics, we are dealing with amplitudes of, of uh, probabilities or complex numbers, and that the square of these complex numbers essentially give us probabilities in the classical uh, meaning of probabilities. So all the knowledge um, that we have about a wave function in principle must allow us in this new framework to calculate the probability of the various results of any kind of measurement. And actually the way this is performed in quantum mechanics is through this formula here that I am showing with the pointer of the mouse. And so essentially it's a bilinear expression uh, in bilinear in terms of a psi and its complex conjugate uh, psi uh, star. So the most general um, bilinear expression that we can we can think of is the following that you see here, where the function phi is going to be a function of the two coordinates here, which are essentially uh, space coordinates in this case, um, and in practice the function phi is going to depend on the nature of the problem that we have at hand or on the nature and the results of measurements that we want to perform. Um, so this is a slightly different situation if compared, let's say, to classic, classical statistics or classical physics, but in a way this is now, um, let's say, our way to construct, to build a quantum theory that take into account all the experimental facts that have been described at the beginning um, of this lesson, but also in lesson number two. Um, of course, there are a few uh, conditions that, um, the, or let's say properties, mathematical properties that the wave function has to respect 
one of them is that the sum of probabilities of all values of the coordinates of the system must be by definition equal to unity. So it means that whatever wave function you are taking into account, uh, in order to make this wave function um, or to assign, a, uh, a, let's say, a physical meaning to, a meaning to this wave function, essentially we have to make sure that this wave function is normalized so that the squares uh, of the wave function over the whole configuration space they sum up and they are equal to one so that essentially every single uh, element of this interval that we are taking here have the meaning of a classical uh, probability that being said uh, we can now introduce the principle of superposition uh, which is a um, rather puzzling uh, principle uh, but if we stick to the mathematics uh, there is nothing very mysterious about this superposition so the one of the very first thing that was seen experimentally in quantum mechanics was also that okay uh, the state of a, of a system could be represented by one wave function C one of Q for example and uh, but it, if the let's say the system is in a different state it could be uh, it could be represented by another wave function that is called uh, that we call uh, c2 and essentially if the the system is in the state c, c1 there will be some kind of measurement or let's say we will have a measurement that will bring us uh, with certain probability to a certain uh, result but if the um, let's say the, the the physical system is in the state c2 then if we perform a measurement then it will provide a second result that can be different uh, but then now from experimental um, from experimental um, um, let's say uh, evidences but also from logical reasoning out of these uh, these experimental results we can assume that any linear combination of the wave function Ψ1 and Ψ2 will also represent the state or let's say they will also represent a valid state of the physical system so if your quantum system can be in the in the let's say in the state that is represented by the wave function Ψ1 but can be also in the state that is represented by the function uh, Ψ2 then the wave function represented by their linear combination which is the one that I am showing here with the, 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 the pointer of the mouse C1 times C1 plus uh, C2 times C2 this is also a valid state of the system um, this doesn't mean though that uh, if you have a particle that can be in the state C1 or can be in the state C2 uh, the fact that it can also be its state can be represented by a linear combination of these two states doesn't mean that the particle is in these two states uh, contemporaneously what it means is that essentially the combination the mathematical combination of these two states is still a valid uh, wave function representing the state of the system but we are still representing through this wave function amplitudes of probabilities and at the very end we are dealing with probabilities so this this linear combination is essentially a linear combination of amplitudes of probabilities so the particle is not in these two states at the same time if you provide if you perform a measurement and if the system is prepared in this in this state which correspond to the linear combination of these two states essentially you will get either one measurement corresponding to measurements of let's say the state c1 or you will get another set of measurements that correspond to the state C2 but you will never get measurements that are in the middle between the 
states represented by MC1, MC2. And I am underlining this fact because unfortunately nowadays sometimes you hear, you hear sentences such as the electrons, the electrons is in two positions at the same time. Well, quantum mechanics does not uh, does not uh, contemplate any of, uh, of of these things. Quantum mechanics is 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 all about probabilities of finding a particle somewhere. So you might have very high probabilities of finding an electron in two different positions, but as soon as you perform the measurement, this electron will be in only one of these positions and not in two contemporaneously. So we are still talking about the real world. Um, so if we want to generalize now this, um, this proposition, this principle of superposition, uh, we can generalize it also to, uh, let's say, a general number of states. And essentially what we can say is that if you have a general number of states, such as Psi1, Psi2, and so on, until Psn, essentially their linear combination is still a valid representation of a state of the physical system. So what you see here, this formula here, is just a special case of this formula here that is more general, and this is a special case that is limited to the linear combination of only two states. So to go ahead now, we introduce the concept of operators in quantum mechanics. So usually in classical mechanics, you will have expressions of variables that are going to tell you, um, to give you the value of a, a certain physical quantity. So for example, if you want to know the kinetic energy, you just have to multiply the mass times the velocity to, or the square of the velocity and then divide by two and then all of a sudden you obtain the kinetic energy. In quantum mechanics things are slightly different and every physical quantity now uh, has a corresponding operator. So if we take a quantity, a general physical quantity F, it will have a corresponding operator F hat, which if you, it is applied to the wave function, will return the values that the variable or the quantity f might take during an experiment or during measurements, actually. So it means that every time you have a wave function, you can ask the wave function about uh, the value of physical quantities um, that you would like to know um, in the system. And the way you do it is by introducing essentially an operator that corresponds to this physical quantity. Uh, for now, we are staying very general and we are not specifying what uh, um, expression or what mathematical expression these operators could have. Uh, we are going to see this in a, in a little while. Uh, but essentially now suppose that you have an operator that corresponds to, um, to a, a particular uh, quantity and we call this operator f hat and the quantity f. You can use this, uh, this equation here that is uh, the equation corresponding to an eigenproblem uh, to essentially find to uh, find what could be the outcomes of measuring the quantity f in the system. And the way you do it is by practically solving this eigenproblem, you are going to find um, eigenvalues, and these eigenvalues are essentially the values of measurements uh, that you could obtain if you measure the system. Um, one has to, 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 to note, though, that in, in quantum mechanics, uh, these operators can have a spectrum that is not necessarily discrete. It can also be continuous. Uh, I tend to underline this because sometimes people think that quantum mechanics is about discretization of, of every variable. This is not the case. You might have, for example, the operator uh, corresponding to the energy, and you would find that the, the spectrum of the energy is a continuous spectrum, or it can be also a mixture of continuous and discrete uh, at times as well. So we have to bear in mind that uh, when we solve this eigen, eigen problem, this eigen problem can provide very, very different, uh, let's say, results uh, depending on the properties of the operator. So 
Now we would like to give more um, details about these operators and we will start from the operator that is called the Hamiltonian operator. So um, if you have, let's say, uh, a wave function psi, we have seen that this is going to completely determine the state of a physical system. So in particular, it means that if you want to know um, the properties of the system, you just have to apply an operator on top of this wave function. And this, this, pro this operator is going to provide you what you can observe. Um, in practice, though, we, we can add more to that. And what we can say is that the wave function is not only going to determine the result of the measurement, that you, you are going to perform over the system, it also determines the subsequent uh, state uh, for subsequent instance that the system will have. So that means in particular that if you know your wave function or if you know the wave function corresponding to a certain system at a certain time, time, you can actually predict what will be the wave function for that system at a time that is, that is bigger than the initial time. Um, the mathematical expression for all of this, or let's say the mathematical way we express the fact that the wave function uh, provides a complete knowledge of the system, uh, and by complete we mean also um, um, the capacity of predicting uh, the state of the system. Uh, essentially, by uh, from this we can we can in practice uh, um, express this mathematically through the equation that you see here. Uh, and what it means here is that the derivative of the wave function depends on the value of the wave function as a, at a certain uh, point in time uh, on which an operator is applied. Um, this operator has to be a linear operator because we have seen that linear combinations of uh, wave functions provide uh, valid solutions. So h hat has to be linear as well. And this h out hat operator that we, we, we have introduced here is called the Hamiltonian operator of the of the, the 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 system so bear in mind this equation this is another very important equation uh, and now what we are going to see is what exact mathematical expression has this hamiltonian operator so in order to get there we have to use a little bit of classical mechanics and by using some arguments of classical mechanics we can actually show that the partial derivative of the function psi with respect to time should be equal to this expression that you see here where we have i which is the imaginary part that is uh, divided by h bar so the, the, the reduced Planck constant times the partial derivative of this quantity s uh, with respect to t and then times c. So in practice from this we can start to realize what is going to be the mathematical shape of the operator h hat or the Hamiltonian operator and in particular what we see from this equation and the equation that we have seen in the previous uh, slide is that the operator uh, the operator h hat uh, is practically obtained fr uh, from the um, operator uh, or from the derivative minus um, derivative partial derivative of s with respect to t. Um, so this tells us already a little bit about what this operator, this Hamiltonian operator, should correspond to. And to add more to this, uh, what we can say at this point is that essentially what we can get if we have the expression for the Hamiltonian is that we can get the main equation um, of the quantum of, of quantum mechanics which is the wave function which we call also the Schrodinger equation. So 
What would be the Hamiltonian of a free particle? This is easy to show. We just need to use the Galileo relativity principle. And in this case, in classical mechanics, by using the homogeneity and the, isotro the, is the isotropy of space, we can show that the energy in this particular case would be equal to P square divided by 2m, which is a classical result that is very well known in classical physics. Uh, this doesn't have the shape of an operator, but this is going to help us to get the operator. So to go slightly ahead, now that we have this relation of a free particle, uh, classical relation for the energy, which is E equal P square over 2M, we can practically generalize this for um, every eigenvalue uh, of the energy and momentum and in practice what we are going to get from that is that in, mm, the operator, the Hamiltonian operator is equal to this new operator that you see here where essentially 1 over 2m is taken from here so nothing new here and then p square now is the sum of the operators that represent the momentum so you have the sum of the squares depending for every uh, let's say axis uh, of, of your Cartesian frame um, so from there we can uh, obtain very quickly the Hamiltonian of a freely moving particle which is going to be this thing that you see here where nabla now is the sum of these operators here which are free operators and actually this is the Laplacian, the Laplacian operator so the Hamiltonian operator for a free particle is easy to find and is, is in practice equal to minus h bar square over 2m multiplied by the Laplacian operator. Um, in the very same way, in, we can generalize this to a system of non-interacting particles. So imagine now that you have, let's say, n electrons uh, that do not, interact in, do not interact with each other. Then the Hamiltonian is uh, in practice just the same of uh, the Hamiltonians uh, is the sum, sorry, of the Hamiltonians of the separate particles, which is this expression that you see here at the bottom of the slide. So for a free particle, this is now solved. And we know that if we have a free particle, let's say a free electron, we know that the, the Hamiltonian is going to be this one, which is plugged in the wave equation. And then all of a sudden we have a way to predict what is going to be the shape of the wave function in the future. And in the very same way, we can, we can do similar things for systems of non-interacting particles. In this particular case, the Hamiltonian would look like the one that we have we have just shown. So now to continue a little bit and to make things a little bit more interesting, uh, we want to see what is the shape or the mathematical expression for the Hamiltonian of interacting particles. And what we can show is that essentially this is done in more or less the same way it would be done in classical mechanics. So we have already seen what is the Hamiltonian of an ensemble of non-interacting particles. So it would be this part that we see here. So the only thing that we have to add at this point is the operator corresponding to the interactions happening between the particles. And in quantum mechanics, I mean, the, the way uh, this is done is essentially by um, adding the potential energy of the interaction. So it doesn't really change compared to what is uh, what we do in, in classical mechanics. The operator of the energy at the very end is going to be the sum of a kinetic term, which is represented by this first term here, plus a potential term that is represented by this function here. And so if we want to um, apply this, for example, to a very simple case, which is uh, the case of a single particle that is uh, moving in an external field, then the Hamiltonian would be essentially this Hamiltonian that you see here, where it's very, very clear that this is the sum of the kinetic operator 
plus uh, the potential operator which explicitly uh, 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 look uh, or reads like what you see here so in here you don't have any operator because this is just a function and here you recognize the Laplacian operator because uh, in practice the kinetic uh, the kinetic term is represented by an operator in quantum mechanics so we now know what the Hamiltonian for a system would look like like uh, in the case of a single particle free particle in the case of a single particle that is immersed in um, an external field and in the case of um, let's say interacting particles um, so finally we can de we can depict the Schrodinger equation and essentially we have uh, in practice we have Two Schrodinger equation. The first one is known as the time dependent equation. So this would be the time dependent Schrodinger equation. And the second one is the time independent equation that reads like um, this equation here that I am showing with the, the mouse pointer. In every case, whatever you are using, so depending if you are interested in a, st a st um, let's say, st um, static regime, a stationary regime, or if you are interested on the time dependent evolution of the wave function in any case the Hamiltonian will always look the same and it will be the sum of a connecting a kinetic term plus a potential term where we have seen that the kinetic term looks like this one so this is the corresponding uh, kinetic operator while the potential term um, would look like this one so in the case of the potential actually we don't really have an operator we are just using the potential itself and the sum of these two give us this Hamiltonian here that we now know um, we now know how to use so in, in every time you have a system you are going to find first of all the kinetic term then the potential term and from that you can have uh, immediately the Hamiltonian operator and then depending on if you are studying a time dependent situation or a stationary uh, situation you are going to plug this Hamiltonian in the corresponding e equation depending on the problem that you have at hand and this concludes this lesson for today. Thank you very much for your attention and see you soon in the next lesson.